I think anything in life that is challenging and you survive that makes you stronger. On the 40th episode of Passion and Progress, CBS News national correspondent Jerika Duncan. This interview takes place at the CBS News headquarters in New York City, where Jerika has been since 2013. She's reported on a wide range of national stories and breaking news, including the shooting deaths of four Marines and a Navy sailor in Chattanooga, historic snowstorms in Boston, and the 70th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy. One of the things I'm most jealous of is she got to spend a whole month with the national women's soccer team during their 2015 World Cup title. In this interview, we talk about the day-to-day responsibilities of a national news correspondent and what it's like to be available to go report on breaking news at a moment's notice while also raising a family in New York City. Before we get into the podcast, I just want to remind everyone that this show is supported by viewers and listeners like you on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Javier Mercedes. Thank you to everybody that is supporting me so far. If that's not your cup of tea, you can support the show by sharing it out with your friends on social media. If you want to tag me on anything, I'm at Javier Mercedes X. That's J-A-V-I-E-R Mercedes X, just like the car. And last but not least, if you have been consuming this podcast on the iTunes app, it would mean the world to me if you wrote me a review. To those that have already written me a review, thank you so much. It helps grow the podcast and spread the word within the whole iTunes ecosystem. With all that housekeeping out of the way, let's move on to episode 40 of the Passion and Progress show with Jerika Duncan, CBS News National Correspondent. What is up, Merce Nation? Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion and Progress show, where we talk to inspiring individuals and hopefully through hearing their stories, you too are motivated to go out and pursue your passions. I am so grateful to be here in CBS News headquarters with National News Correspondent Jerika Duncan. How are you today? I am good, Javier, and I've seen your podcast. And I have to say, I am excited to be here in your presence. <laughs> For the audience, can you say what you do on a day-to-day basis here? So I am a national correspondent, and my job is to gather information, tell the viewers what's going on. Because I don't necessarily have a beat, I have an opportunity to do a wide-ranging list of stories. I cover weather. I cover breaking news. I've covered sports. I've covered tragedy, unfortunately, but there's no one area that I have to specifically focus on. Although in the last year and a half, I've focused a lot on like the post Me Too movement and mm-hmm. sexual assault, sexual harassment, but I do a little bit of everything. It's been great. I love how you call it beats. I didn't know they were called beats. I, I yeah. would have been like a niche or niche, however you want to say it. Yes. But uh, mm-hmm. if that's the case, how exactly do you choose or how, is it just like there's breaking news and then you you go do that thing how does it come across your table well because we cover the entire nation mm-hmm. uh and sometimes you could be sent on things that send you beyond the united states at this level there are stories that happen there are managers on an editorial level that say you know what we should send Jerika on that story for whatever reason. Sometimes it's just based on the stories we've been covering. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it has to do with sort of the cultural sensitivity of the issue, perhaps. And then, of course, we pitch stories. You know, unlike with local news, where there is more of an appetite for what do you have today. At local news, you're asked, what are your two or three stories that you can do today that we can get on air? <laughs> At this level, you can pitch, but there's a general list of stories that need to be covered. Mm -hmm. It's always important to pitch. That is the sign of a great reporter, someone that comes with their own stories. But again, there are certain stories that have to be covered. And I think even when you get assigned those stories, it's a matter of you finding a way to cover it in a unique way and getting interviews that maybe the competition won't get. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you love what you do. I do. You have and such I a just, swag when you're talking it's about so it. It's <laughs> funny because I really recently came into accepting that I do love what I do mm-hmm. and not feeling bad about it. Um, I have a five-year-old daughter and I love being a mom, but I really love the flexibility that this job can provide in terms of the stories that I do. And my schedule is crazy, but I also have managers that If you go six or seven days straight, we'll say, you know what, why don't you take two days off on top of the two days that you're supposed to be off so that you can catch up on life. Um, It doesn't always happen, but I have to say shout out to Andre Rodriguez. (laughs) He's one of my managers. Um, He's very good about making sure that for all of us, there's there's a bit of a balance. 
And I think as long as you're able to kind of have that, it makes it worth continuing on this path. It's not easy, um, but it's great. And I meet so many people every day that remind me to be grateful. Just two days ago, we interviewed um, a family who lost their daughter. She sadly committed suicide. She was a student at Northwestern, star athlete, basketball player. And they're suing the sorority that she pledged. They, they believe that the hazing caused her, pushed her to commit suicide. When you look into the eyes of parents like that, you feel what they're feeling. You, you think you feel what you're feeling, that you don't know what they've experienced. But it's, again, another reminder, especially being a parent, of how grateful you are and just... Um, you know, regardless of how you feel about who's right or who's wrong, mm -hmm. I'm grateful and I love what I do. So, yeah, yeah, I guess there's two things I want to ask about that, but I'll stick with one. Mm -hmm. um, when you are on a moment's notice going out to these stories, because that's what it sounds like sometimes that's what happens. Mm -hmm. How do you cover being a mom at the same time? How do dads <laughs> cover it being dads? <laughs> <laughs> you do what you have to do. Mm hmm. Uh, it can be difficult. That is the reality. I think anytime you are um, a mother, regardless of if you're married or not, a lot of the responsibility still to this day falls on women to know who the teachers are, to know when the next doctor's appointment is, mm. the next dentist appointment, yeah. who's going to watch whom. I mean, it's it's a lot. Yeah. Um, but I'm thankful that I also have a great example. My mother. Yvonne Duncan, I'm gonna give her a shout out on the podcast. <laughs> she had three mm -hmm. and she was married to somebody, my father who used to be in the business, he was a local sports anchor. Um, she moved around a lot. Every time he got a job, she left whatever job she was in and made that sacrifice for the family because my dad had a career that was, you know, paying the bills. Going all over Let's the place. Let's just be real, mm -hmm. Let's, we're on the podcast. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's what yeah. podcasts are all about, right? Mm -hmm. Um, no, but I think to see those sacrifices being made means a lot. But I think also falling in love with a career like this, I'm determined to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I do realize that there may come a time where I have to make decisions for the well-being of my child. But right now, I'm holding on. Do you think I'm they're going to be work. a stronger person because of it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think anything in life that is challenging and you survive that makes you stronger. One of the things that I would do with my past job at the Chive, and I'm going to be doing one in February, but we would cover a lot of charity stories. Mm -hmm. and like I'm going to go out and cover a girl that had part of her brain removed, um, wow. but because of a tumor, but because she was so young, mm -hmm. like everything repairs itself. Mm -hmm. After having kids myself and going and doing these stories, it mm -hmm. just gave me so much perspective mm -hmm. of just love for a child. Yeah. Um, is that something that you bring to all of your stories in terms of relating to an audience? I think, again, even if you don't have children, you were once a child. You have a mother. You have a father. You're human. Mm -hmm. So I, I really believe that most people can relate. It's a matter of, you know, how deep do you go? And for me, sadly, a lot of times I will almost try and put myself in that situation and think about how difficult that must be, mm -hmm. which can be dangerous because then I have to step away and get myself together and like. Yeah, that happens to me too when I'm doing yeah. charity stories. Like I'll, I'll definitely cry mm -hmm. when I'm doing them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get embarrassed? No, no. Well, because they, like I think yeah. other people are seeing these stories and it's right. like. Oh. I do a little bit because I can feel like the water mm -hmm. tearing up in my eyes. And it's always amazing to me to see the strength that maybe the parents or the sister, or the brother, whoever it was, they're exhibiting. And I'm the one that needs the tissue because I'm like, <laughs> sorry, I just need a second. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's real. And I think sometimes it makes you just want to even, you know, hug your kids a little harder or just tell your parents you love them. You appreciate the sacrifices they've made. Um, but yeah, it can be emotionally draining, especially mm -hmm. if you're doing story after story after story that has to do with loss or, you know, tragedy, um, especially in, in terms of sexual assault. You realize that in the many people that I've spoken to now, men or women, they always wonder what their lives could have been had they not been 
sexually assaulted. And I think that's real. And it's, it's a tough pill to swallow when you're trying to sort of tap into that emotional piece, but also be respectful of what they, they say they experienced. Mm -hmm. With that, do you want to talk about what you're uh, doing recently with R. Kelly and like the um, different people you've talked to there? So beginning of the year, Mm -hmm. January 3rd, Lifetime airs a docuseries called Surviving R. Kelly. It's three parts. Each part, I think, was like two hours long. It was um, produced by a woman named Dream Hampton. She obviously had a staff of, of people. She used to work, I believe, at Vibe magazine. And essentially, she gathered a number of women who knew R. Kelly, dated R. Kelly, um, who say they've dated R. Kelly, uh, who say they knew R. Kelly. I got to say they say Mm -hmm. as a reporter. I'm not, you know, you don't want to pin it on me. Yeah. yeah. But and they talk about their experiences, either being emotionally, sexually, um, physically abused, including his ex-wife. And essentially they put it out there for the viewer to decide. And as a result, it's caused um, people have made changes. There was already a campaign called Mute R. Kelly where people have decided um, that they're not going to support the music. But now you have artists uh, like Lady Gaga that are coming out and saying, I regret doing this song with him and I will never perform with him or Mm -hmm. work with him again. Recently, we're still trying to confirm this, but his record label dropped him. I've been in touch with his manager over the last several days, trying to get a statement, trying to get a feel for sort of what the next move is from his camp. And they aren't really commenting. Um, I did speak to one of his attorneys and Mm -hmm. he basically called the docuseries trash. Uh, And then I spoke recently to Sparkle. Sparkle is someone that used to be uh, an artist of R. Kelly's. Mm -hmm. She had a very popular song that did well on the billboards. And she was one of the first, if not the first, to speak out. It was interesting to hear her story today because she stands by the fact that she believes her niece, who she says was about 14 at the time, was on that infamous tape, that infamous sex tape, Mm -hmm. that um, he was charged with child pornography and then later acquitted. And she talks about that. She talks about seeing her niece since then, having a relationship with her, not even talking about the R. Kelly stuff because she still sees her as her baby girl, her her baby niece. And it was it was fascinating. I really hope that we're able to do kind of like a web extra, but essentially she stands by like that was my niece in that video. Mm-hmm. So in her mind, she believes that R. Kelly is um, wrong and that that was criminal mm-hmm. uh, because at the time, as she quoted, the girl who she believes was in the tape said, that's not me. And the parents didn't speak up. He was acquitted. Again, this is according to Sparkle. So it's, it's definitely been one of those stories where people have stopped, paused, thought about how they feel, asked themselves, are they really okay with listening to his music and buying his music or promoting his music, going to his concerts, his shows, et cetera. And I think it just speaks to a turning point in our culture. And I think if you look historically over time, uh, a lot of women haven't been listened to on Mm -hmm. so many different levels. But when it comes to sexual assault, now is the time where I think people feel like, at least, again, this is from my interviewing many people who say they were sexually assaulted at this point, they really feel like people are hearing them. And I think that's great Mm -hmm. because, you know, if these things in fact happen to them, can you imagine living in this world and feeling like nobody's going to believe you because you're poor or no one's going to believe you because you're a woman or no one's going to believe you because you don't have power. No one's going to believe you because of the color of your skin. These are all things that people have told me that this is why they stayed silent for so long, but no more. They're sharing their stories. On the flip side, there have been countless times that I've wanted to talk to some of these men. And more than not, I'm asked to go to their attorneys and the statement is kind of the same. He did not have, you know, non-consensual sex or we have no comment. Um, But 
I would love to hear from, you know, some of these men to to help us understand what they think happened if they, in fact, believe that they are innocent or what was potentially misunderstood when you talk about situations where they thought it was okay to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So it's, it's a very complicated and complex (laughs) issue. (laughs) Yeah. And honestly, it's one of those things that I've realized that um, you have to be careful in talking to folks who've been through that sort of trauma because you, you know, you have to ask the questions as a journalist but you have to be so delicate because you have to kind of come from the mindset of like, this is what they're saying happened to them. And it can be very triggering, very painful, um, and sort of take them back to that place. And, you know, you, you also have to sort of keep it together to continue to try to understand and help other people understand what's going on. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is mm-hmm. like, even when you're starting to tackle mm-hmm. that story from the beginning, how do you go about that process of... How do I cover this? Well, I would say, honestly, with every story, I probably say a bit of a silent prayer, just like, you know, thank you, God, for the opportunity, but just help me to tell the story the way that it should be told. And I think it's also feeling out the person you're talking to, because you can look into someone's eyes and know when maybe you've stepped the line or, Ooh. you know, mm-hmm. if, if they're not comfortable Mm-hmm. sort of um, answering the the line of questioning and asking them because a lot of times it's not live. So are you okay? Do you need a second? Or they'll just tell you, I don't want to talk about that. Mm-hmm. So it's just, you know, being considerate and understanding that you may not get every question answered, but we're going to get to a place at least where, again, our purpose as journalists is to help people understand what's going on in their communities, what's going on around the country, what's going on around the world. I feel like being a correspondent in your position, your brain has to be firing on all engines just to get, even from subject matter to subject matter, can Mm -hmm. you talk about how, say you go out and you do some, like when you started doing the Me Too movement, Mm -hmm. how do you get up to speed with where everything is by the time you have an interview? Research, mm-hmm. YouTube, <laughs> isn't that the platform? <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, You're yeah. on. I mean, YouTube is great because you could type in someone's name and find out, you know, what the latest interview they've done. Um, it's just research, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at this level, we have producers, we have bookers, we have people that I can presumably go to and say, hey. Can you help me find out some intel on X, Y, and Z? So, I mean, and again, it doesn't really matter whether you're at the local level or the national level. You need to prepare for an interview. So that involves doing your research and finding out whatever the latest is before you sit down with people. Yeah, it just seems like if you have every single type of beat, I'm just going to keep, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, no, just, like, I'm just going to keep saying the beats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to do the work. Mm-hmm. And whether something breaks right now and my managers say, go to Oklahoma, this happened. Well, you better believe on my taxi ride home to get my bag, I'm researching. On the taxi ride from my home to the airport, I'm researching. On the plane, I'm getting on the internet and I'm researching. Sometimes maybe typing up a script and sending it to a producer before I touch down. So it's using as much of the time that you have before you go on television to figure out what happened, who did it happen to, what's the aftermath, what's next. Mm -hmm. If there was an amateur correspondent, what what are some of the things that they might do that like trip them up on making a story come to air Mm -hmm. in a, in a efficient manner? Some of the things that uh, might trip them up. Well, I feel like, it's funny because working at CBS, a lot of the people that I work with, I mean, there's a nice mix now, but when I first started working here, I definitely felt like an amateur. Even though I mm-hmm. had been doing news for over 10 years, you realize you are now in the pool of people who've covered wars, the White House. I mean, literally people who've put their lives on the line to cover Afghanistan, Iraq, wars. Mm -hmm. Um, It's no joke. So 
I think the key is coming in and being humbled by the people you're around and not being afraid to ask for help. There are many times when I first started out that, you know, I welcomed and still welcome people telling me what I could do differently to make my work stronger, whether it be a stand up. And it doesn't have to come from somebody that's older. I remember working with um, a producer that's younger than me. He's still here. Now he's has a more senior position on the morning show, but he's like four or five years younger than me. And at the time he was working as uh, an associate producer on evening news, but I believe he started out as a digital journalist. So that essentially means he had a camera. He would go out and get the best video and send pictures back and describe what it was, et cetera. But this was a younger person when I first started out telling me that I needed to do my stand up again. And here's what you need to do to make it stronger. I think the key to surviving this is being open to those suggestions. Of course, everyone's going to have an opinion and every suggestion isn't for you. But by and large, you have to understand that people are watching it from their vantage point. So if they think "Uh, your energy was a bit weak, let's do that again. Mm -hmm. There's a good chance they're not doing that to be petty. Mm -hmm. They want the best product because they have to answer to someone too to go, well, why didn't you tell her? To do that again, that was that was weak. You had, you know, snow next to you. You should have referenced it or, or whatever the case may be. So I think it's about being open. And I think that's also how you don't sort of get jaded and thinking you know it all because the times have changed. The technology has changed. The way that we report and receive news has changed. So it's important to keep an open mind about how we do our job and recognize when people are really just trying to make us better, make us look as best as we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree, especially on YouTube, because there's that comment section. Mm-hmm. And in the comment section, you can get negative comments. But the thing yeah. is, I, I invite those, especially from a what sort of negative uh, comments. Do you get? Well, it'd be like, well, say, say it's like I did look a tutorial. Me, I'm turning this around on you. Well, that's fine. So. Um, let's say I do a tutorial on something. Okay. And if I went too fast mm-hmm. or I didn't show a certain part mm-hmm. or they're like, I don't like this or I don't like that. I completely mm-hmm. just like what you were talking about with the stand up pieces. Right. I, I completely invite that because mm-hmm. I'm like, man, I want to get better. Right. And there's no way of knowing that unless you have feedback. The stories that you do cover mm-hmm. of all of your past. What are some of your favorites? A 15 year old girl recently wrote me a letter telling me that she's doing a project for school and she wanted to interview me. Oh. So we did the interview yesterday. This has been an interesting week. Like, mm-hmm. really? You want to interview me? Um, Twice but she in also one interviewed week? <laughs> Seth Doan, who's a CBS uh, national correspondent or international correspondent uh, based in Italy. And she said that she was breaking it up into international, national, and local and wanted to find sort of some of the common threads. In that, she did ask me, what are some of your favorite Mm -hmm. stories or most Mm -hmm. memorable? And I realized that it's so hard to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Like, because I really do love what I do, they're all, they all kind of like hold a special place in my heart or I take something away from each one of them. But the stories that I remember pointing to were the Women's World Cup when I covered that. Mm -hmm just how exciting that was to travel with them literally for almost a month in Canada. And at the time, my daughter was like eight months old. So that was the first time that I was really, really away from her for a significant amount of time. But I learned a lot. Oh, you know what? I take that back. That was when I covered um, D-Day. The what? 70th anniversary. 70th anniversary. Thank you. Look at you doing the research. (laughs) There, There really have been so many stories. And, and because mm-hmm. at this level, it's usually all significant. Super, yeah, it seems like everything um, you're doing is super impactful. It really is, which is great, you know, at the national level. But even, you know, when I think of local stories, when I was in Buffalo, New York, I covered um, the death of, I believe it was 50 people on flight 3407. That was national news. Uh, but that was a lot, but I learned a lot. And I think that was one of those stories where you see how change happened over time in terms of reporters and just people asking questions about the amount of sleep the crew got and, you know, how those things have changed to try and make sure that that never happens again. That seems like it's a, uh, it's also interviewing families in that situation. Like I can't, 
Like I'm interviewing you right now, but it's just like, I can't, I can't imagine asking questions of somebody that that's just happened. Right. And in fact, the plane went into a home. And if I recall, the mother and the daughter were able to get out. And I think the husband passed away. But can you imagine a plane landing on your house Mm-mm. and anybody surviving? No. I mean, I can't get on a plane to this day and not think about Flight 3407, which is why I definitely say a prayer before. And as soon as we get we land, I'm always thanking the crew, like, thank you for getting us here safely. Um, but it, that's kind of like how I guess a story can even sort of play on you after the fact. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't mind flying, but it's. I can't not think about those sort of situations. I pray I don't, that's not how I go down. But yeah, that's crazy. And it's tough. I mean, even just the thought of people realizing they're descending and knowing this is, Candace. I know. <laughs> yeah, but it's like. It's so you, uneasy. I'm sorry. But oh, no, no, like no. But it's but it, but it, definitely uh, ask yourself yeah. in terms of those, the coverage. And even when I was telling you about the student in North, uh, at Northwestern, um, Jordan Hankins. You try to under you you can't understand, but you wonder like what those last moments, <clears throat> excuse me, must have been like to feel that alone or that sad that you just you're helpless, you know. Mm-hmm. And we don't know all the details, you know. I, we asked the attorney in that um, instance were there mental health issues before, and you know he wouldn't comment. But it doesn't really matter, I guess. At the end of the day. You are it matters in the the court of law, I'm sure, obviously. But I think just as a human, you you just see two parents that lost their oldest child Mm -hmm. and will have to live with that forever. Um, Sorry to bring it. (laughs) Uh, down. P- to, well, yeah. Like, what are? Let P- me think pivoting, of a happier well, story no, no, that so, I've covered. I'm sorry. So, uh, <laughs> pivoting to what you were talking about with the national women's team. Yeah. Is there any chance? Any chance that I could interview anyone from the national women's Ooh. team? There's... You know who you should try? Abby Wombat. Okay. She's. I will amazing. reach out. She's so cool, mm-hmm. so down to earth. I just saw her on Twitter. I think she's starting some campaign, something about the Wolf Pack. The reason I bring it up is because another woman like, from Jersey who, who scored like Lloyd. Four, thank Carly you, Lloyd, Carly yeah. Lloyd. Yes, she was outstanding as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, all of those women after press, new, you know, news conference after news conference after news conference, you kind of get a sense of their personalities. Mm-hmm. But I remember Carly Lloyd was just so cool and laid back and such a hard worker. Mm hmm. So you should try and talk to her. All right. Yeah. That's what I'll do. Because the World Cup's coming up. Yeah. Of all of the national sporting things, I'm, I'm most obsessed with national women's team and the, mm. and the national women's soccer league yeah. as opposed to like NFL or NBA. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they would love that. Yes. That's great. When you got into reporting yourself, because mm-hmm. you said your dad was a news anchor mm-hmm. uh, for sports, mm-hmm. did it have a lot to do with your decision? So... Interestingly Ooh, enough, I want to see where this goes. <laughs> when I went to Ohio University, I thought perhaps I could be the next music video director. Awesome. I wanted to be like the next Hype Williams, Little X. These were people that I remember watching in the 90s, telling my age, yes. Do you know what uh, music videos um, they did to give reference? It seems like they, they were just They just did always, everything? <laughs> well, because their names would always flash up right before the video or maybe yeah. at the end. And I remember also thinking, I don't really like how women are portrayed. seen or mm-hmm. portrayed in some of these videos. They need more women to sort of facilitate the images that are being shown and how we're being shown. And um, that was sort of my reason. On top of just, I enjoy the production side and the vision. And you have a vision and actually making it come to fruition. So my first internship was actually at Arista Records where I got to, you know, help the process of, you know, getting, well, I can't say I was responsible for anything any of the artists actually did, but I saw treatments and I saw how it was being done. Mm -hmm. And I understood all of the work that went behind it before they did produce this three or four minute video. Um, But then I got to OU and, you know, I kind of always had the journalism bug, I think because of, moving from city to city, being in newsrooms, growing up in newsrooms, seeing what that was like. 
And ultimately, I thought to myself, well, my dad does it. He does pretty well. He seems like he likes his job. Maybe I could do that. Mm -hmm. But just news, because I always had an interest in it. I was a kid that stayed up late and watched like 2020 with my mom at 10 or 11. Just, who does that? I don't know, actually. <laughs> I know. I always had an interest in, in, in news. So, no. uh, What's some of the best pieces of advice that you've gotten, whether it be from other colleagues or people that you're interviewing? Find something that makes you money while you're asleep. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the former correspondent. Mm-hmm. No, but I think it's important to, again, that's more as you get older because you also realize that... Um, it's a great job, any job, you know, you have to try and, and think about, especially now, like, what would I be doing if this didn't work out? Or how do I build on, you know, where I'm at right now so that I can, you know, just be comfortable? Mm -hmm. I think that's everybody in life. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that at 35 years old, running here, there and everywhere, like, Will I be doing that at 55 if, if I'm still, you know, in this business? Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. You know, so it's like, what, what can I be doing maybe to get to that next level, to get to 48 hours or 60 minutes or some of the other platforms that are different? Still a lot of work, but allow you a little bit more flexibility and give you a more of a, a carved out beat or, or niche or mm -hmm. do you, space. Do you set goals for yourself every year? Absolutely. Well, what does that look like? Is it just like, is it Absolutely. like, is it like a five year plan, a one year plan, mm. and then everything in between? Or is it you're consistently persistent in everything that you're doing? In the beginning, I remember thinking, if I'm not advancing in the next three to five years, then I will try something else. If television news doesn't work out for me, maybe I'll try something else. Okay. So now it's, it's worked well. I've been incredibly blessed, been given some great opportunities. And I'm extremely thankful, but I think in this space, it's like, okay, what more can I do? Where else can I sort of grow? What, what yeah. other platforms would I love to work on within CBS? So, you know, we've got Sunday morning, we've got 48 hours, we've got 60 minutes, we've got CBSN. And I think it's a matter of not just limiting my, limiting myself to the morning show and our evening news program, but yeah, let me branch out maybe and see about doing longer form pieces because we have some incredible programming where it's more than just doing a minute and a half or two minute hit. It's a little bit more in depth. So I think for me, my goal is to moving forward, create opportunities so that I can maybe work in those spaces. And I know that it takes an enormous amount of hard work. Again, my colleagues set the bar extremely high. And a lot of them who do all of those things have been here much longer than me. But I think it's a matter of constantly pitching to some of those shows and coming up with different ideas so that even if I don't get to do those stories, at least I'm on their radar. At least they know that I'm interested. And part of being a journalist is being OK with the word no. People tell me no every day. So it doesn't even phase me. It just means not right now. What was interesting to me with that is like how successful people are and mm -hmm. um, hearing the word no mm -hmm. and then going from that and being like, well, that's maybe like what you just said. It can be. Not right not, now. We'll just we'll just yeah. uh, table it. And then yeah, we'll go we'll from there. I love that expression. <laughs> you know, it's it's not definite in this business. There are instances where no means no. But in television news, I think no is then I ask, well, how would I? How could I? What? How do I get to yes? Taking that information and retweaking whatever it is that maybe your idea was. But I think that one should not lose their passion for whatever it is that they ultimately want to shine light on. That's part of being a journalist. We're not covering this. We need to cover this. Okay, you don't like the pitch? Okay, how about if we do it this way? Okay, what if we got this interview? And you just keep going. And then when you're passionate about something, you're not going to stop. Or you're just going to find other ways to do it. Mm -hmm. I love how stern you are with saying that. Because like, I feel like if you were pitching me anything, I'd be like, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you should be my boss. <laughs> and well, I get all my stuff approved right now. I'm yeah. just kidding. But it's good. I mean, that's, that's what makes it so fun and interesting. 
Because when you get that yes, and then you get the support being producers, editors, people that believe in your vision, it's amazing. And it's like, yes. And that doesn't always happen. It doesn't happen often, but because it doesn't happen often, that's what you strive for. Mm -hmm. And when it happens, it's so special. And you're just like, yes. Yeah. Victory. Uh, there's two things I always ask everybody at the end of the podcast. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, why do you do what you do? Why do I do what I do? I, I have to obviously naturally growing up around it has has been influential. I do what I do. Because I enjoy people, I enjoy learning. I enjoy getting different perspectives. And this is the best job in the world. I get to experience so much and meet so many different people and travel to so many different places. I used to say it's like going on field trips all the time. And I used to love going on field trips as a kid. Who doesn't like going out of, you know, get out of the classroom and like mm -hmm. go explore, go to the museum. That's so exciting. Pack your little lunch for the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now I get a little per diem, go to a restaurant. <laughs> the adult version. <laughs> so, yeah, I love what I do. That's why I'm doing it. And mm -hmm. I enjoy people. I love listening to people's stories, asking questions. Just like, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those jobs where if you're not interested in constantly learning, then maybe it's not for you. But it's pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds like you want to satisfy a curious mind. And, I have a uh, very curious mind. And then even with, <laughs> even with that in your uh, profession, mm -hmm. going to the authorities in that uh, whatever said space and being like actually talking to the people where right. wherever that is, which right. is I think therein lies the like the cool like you get to yeah. actually be on the ground level of right. learning from the people that know what they're they're talking about. Exactly. You know? Yeah, and then challenging folks. Mm -hmm. being a voice for other people and asking questions that people want to know. Uh, second question I always ask is if you were to, uh, if it was Ohio university, mm. um, if there was somebody graduating from there right now mm -hmm. and they wanted to pursue where you're at right now, mm -hmm. uh, as a national correspondent, what would you tell them? What advice would you give them? Follow your heart, have fun, work hard. As my dad would say, hard work pays off. And I truly believe that. It's so simple, but it's true. Mm -hmm. I love how concise that is because you know exactly like, hey, follow this and you'll probably be successful. I think the having fun part people forget. Mm -hmm. And even when I was in Elmira, New York, New York, doing stories on like rabid cats. Is that, <laughs> is that the correct? I feel like that was the first story I did, if I recall. There was a cat running loose. That may have rabies. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the spectrum of and what I you've covered. <laughs> all that to say, I enjoyed covering it, even though it was such a small, local. It was, yes, we have to tell the public about this cat. <laughs> People need to be safe. <laughs> Those are the stories that, you know, exist in a smaller community. People want to know. But um, Elmira, New York was that place where everybody is straight out of college. And it's a small town, but I, I remember having fun there because there was like a little Irish pub that we all used to hang out at mm -hmm. and they had like karaoke nights and you realize too, you don't need much. If you kind of embrace a community, it'll embrace you. So that's sort of what I've done with every place that I've been in. I could go, oh, there's no malls, there's no movie, th you know, and they did have a movie theater and a small mall. But once you get involved in any community and you start just embracing it, I think it's like anything in life. What you put out is what you'll receive. Hard work and talking to people. Hard work, talk to people, follow your heart, have fun. Uh, where can people find you? You can find me at Jerika Duncan on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle. I do not have a Facebook page. I have one sorry photo posted on Instagram. I think my Instagram handle is Jerika period Duncan or Jerika Duncan. It's sad. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, if you have any story ideas, you can email me at Jerika period Duncan at CBS dot com. And it's just any kind of story. I'm usually looking for something that has a national piece to it. But even if you had something local, mm -hmm. I would try and point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But 
hey, if you watched or listened to this podcast and you took the time to see me outside of the realm of CBS Evening News or CBS This Morning, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time. And this thank has been you awesome. For asking me to do this. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. And it's been kind of like cool to do something different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank Get you. interviewed twice in one week. I know, right? Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see how Miriam was her name, how her project turns out. Shout out to Miriam. I'm I'll sure, send her a link. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be. She was so top nice. So just cool. the just the fact that she went from local, uh, national, international. international like, yeah. Wait, 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 how are you thinking of that? <laughs> She's only 15. Yeah, that's awesome. She's way ahead of the curve. So yeah. Awesome. Well, She'll thank you again. Great. Till next time, everybody. Live that life of abundance, and I'll see you on the next episode.